Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Are you guys ready for this live podcast? Thank you, one person in the crowd that's ready for this live podcast. There we go. Tonight, we have the We Are Libertarians podcast live and on stage for you. Please give a round of applause for Chris Spangle, Greg Lentz, and Dakota Davis. I swear to God, this audience must have something on Hillary Clinton. They're so dead. Hey, you guys ready for the We Are Libertarians podcast? Okay, we're showing signs of life. How's the video, Harry? All right. It's going to be a night, guys. I might, quite the mood. I might be getting the flu. Um, Kat isn't here. She no called no showed. I don't even know where she's at. Well, you know what happened. I know what happened. We'll talk about it in just a second, but welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves, and we explain to you what is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Essentially, we make you sound smarter when you're talking to your friends. Well, Greg makes you sound smarter when you're talking to your friends. So please be, sure to, <laughs> please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes. Like us on Facebook, subscribe on Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. In exchange for supporting our program, we'll give you all kinds of bonus content and freebies. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at WeAreLibertarians.com. So if you're new to the program, we catch up for the first 20 minutes or so, then deep dive into analyzing current events and society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned, the language can be offensive. I think that's what happened to the crowd. You had Abdul and Harry on, and the white that. supremacist <laughs> argument really uh, kind of... You have two hurt. black guys on, and they talk about white supremacy, and all of a sudden, the audience flees. I've never felt more clan-shamed in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> that is the voice of Greg Lenz, my co-host. Greg, how are you? I'm doing well, buddy. I know you're... Uh, this is... This is uh, it's going to be one of those nights where I tell something about you that you needed to know about yourself. Some truth-telling. I woke up punchy. Yeah. I woke up a little grumpy. Uh -huh. And it's been downhill from there. And now you're just at the point where, uh, you know. That's how Aunt Donna happened. It is. I that's remember how, it very well. That's how those moments happen where I'm just like, you know what? You know, that's how religious hand jobs happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll explain Aunt Donna later. Also on the stage tonight is one of the co-hosts, frankly my favorite host, of the Boss Hog of Liberty. It is one young Dakota Davis. Dakota, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to hear that I'm your favorite co-host. You are. And you're going to have to hold that mic real close because you talk so quiet. All right. It, it's, it's such a blessing to be called your favorite co-host. Are you uh, nervous to be up on stage? I'm so nervous. It's been... It's been a, a long time and a couple roofies ago since I was up on a stage like this. <laughs> that donkey show in Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were hoping to have your fiance Audrey Joe up here, but she, she... She wanted none of it. She flat out told me that if I invited her up here, she would never talk to me again. So Audrey <laughs> Joe, come on up. All right. Uh, she, she, uh, then she yelled at me because I didn't uh, bring her pie pan back to her. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Which is a party foul. That is, it's a huge party. Thing. But we all know when I leave a party, I take something with me. Yep. I'm like Kat Anagnos, which Oops. let's let's start with her. <clears throat> Kat Anagnos is supposed to be our co-host. I stuck up for her, Greg. You did. And I did. I, I remember when you, I think it was back in April, and you said, there's this girl. She is going to be interning at Bob and Tom, and I, she's interested in libertarianism. I think you'll like her. She's talented. She's funny. She's smart. And then you introduced me to Kat. Right. And it's pretty clear you lied. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where's that girl at? Exactly. I thought, this is fate, you're CNN. Right. You know, and so then I was like, okay, well, let's not do this permanently. You know, let's give it 120 days. <laughs> right. Figured 120 days, that's fair. You know, that's what, four, that's yeah, well, four months, roughly. Well, you know how I am with college girls. Exactly, right. <laughs> right. So this is, this is I get excited and ahead of myself. It's like, you know, it's like the milk that Harry gave Jeremiah. It has an expiration date. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I was like, 180 days is good. And some might call that a trimester. Right. <laughs> and so this is roughly, you know, this was the end of the first trimester, and we had a discussion. I said, Chris, this is going to be a potato. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to keep it, or do you want to get rid of it? And so... That's what happened. The audience is dead silent because they, they are like, these are the two biggest assholes on the planet. Cat <laughs> is not dead. 
We also did not abort. But she is a potato. We also <laughs> did not abort cat. She had uh, sorority stuff this week, and so she was up for like at, till three every night. That got up two hours later, and then got the flu. Yeah. And, did you you showed me the video? She it was yeah. midday for her sorority. Yeah. She there's Terry a video. She tarried the shit oh out of her new <laughs> like soror- sorority granddaughter. Think of the greatest tackle you've ever seen in the NFL and multiply it by three, and that is what Cat did to a girl yesterday. I swear to God, if she had played for the Colts, they'd have beat the Rams yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. Cat the juice and Agnos. Yes, <laughs> you, absolutely. You should see it on our Instagram or our Twitter. It's amazing. And so you wonder where that crazy strength comes from, and that's why I say potato. Well, what do you want from Kat? <laughs> Kat <laughs> so Kat called me this morning, or she FaceTimed me, and let me tell you, peg and ten on the uggo meter. And I said, listen, hon, we can't have an uggo on the podcast. <laughs> That's not true. We have quite the aesthetic, huh? She's like, <coughs> Chris, I've lost my voice. I was like, Greg will be so happy to hear this. <laughs> you, that's what I told her. I was like, Kat, you never have to apologize for your absence. <laughs> it is always welcome. <laughs> There's no need. You know, nothing makes me happier than when you have a conflicting schedule. As she said, you know I'm really sick because what would possibly keep me away from attention? I know. <laughs> I know. So we wish Kat the best. Yes. Uh, and we're talking about 9-11 tonight. We are, which she wouldn't have been much help for, given her age. She's 20, and uh, part of what we wanted to do tonight was talk about 9-11 yeah. and uh, how instrumental it has been in American politics. Now, do you want to start with that, or do you want to start first with a little bit about Irma? That's, um, not, that's tonight part of the well, proceeds. Well, le- let me walk through this a little bit. I don't know yet. I haven't figured out what we're doing tonight not yet. Not big quite. on hurricane help? Yeah, um, and so... So, uh, Kat d- couldn't be here tonight, so we invited Dakota to come along. Yep. Kat, now, Dakota, how old are you? I'm 21 uh, and six months. 21 and six? You're yeah. 21 and a half. Oh, six months. I'm 21 and a half. Months. At some point, you're going to have to become an adult and lose the half. You, you, when you turn 34 like I did, you're like, there's no half. I'm uh, 30. That's how old I am. I'm halfway to death. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm middle-aged. Uh, and so... It, yeah, we, we'll get into Irma and uh, Harvey in just a little bit, but when we told people that we were doing a live podcast on 9-11, laughter was the most uh, common response that we got. Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty sick you know, and sadistic group that listens to us and right. finds these things funny. So You're all disgusting and disturbing, and we love it. You're our degenerates, though, our little cast of deplorables. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and so... But 9-11 really, and the, the mic is down here on the side of the stage for a reason. We're, we're also going to invite some people to come up and talk up here. Uh, because not only do we want to talk about how 9-11 impacted us individually, uh, we also want to talk about how it impacted the country. Yeah. And the idea really came about when I was talking to Kat, and Kat really just didn't have a memory of 9-11. I mean, how that's a, that's a, that blows my mind because I would consider that the most historical defining event that has shaped sort of my like worldview. Yeah, uh, and how old were you, and what grade were you in, Dakota, when it took place? I was I was five years old. Five years old. Five years old. I was in preschool. Were you still in pull-ups? Uh, I think I had graduated from pull-ups, but Did I you might. Your shoes? I don't know. I. Uh, I was. I might have been at the stage where like you're out of pull-ups, but like the people just let you run around naked because right. they you, they don't feel comfortable putting underwear on you yet. Right. And they just have to walk. So around. they just would rather you defecate wherever it goes. Right. Right. That's right. exactly. Henry County is weird. Henry County is quite the experience. I'll tell you what. It's like being in India. Fifty percent of us poop on the road. <laughs> <laughs> there is a movie in India called Toilet now. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. And just to let you know, Tim McGuire, when we hear you talking in the audience, it's all the way up here where we're at, too. Uh, l- let you be oh warmed. Petty. He's getting called <laughs> I out. told you, it's one of those nights. I'm not going to put up with hecklers. Ooh. Where's Maya? Tranny prop. She's late. <laughs> yep. So, so you were five years old. What memory do you have of 9-11? Okay, I was five years old. I was in, a, I was in preschool at a... At a Baptist church in Newcastle, Calvary. At church, okay. Calvary Baptist Church. Is that when you got bit by snakes? Uh, 
Yeah, but it didn't have any effect because I'm a strong believer. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm pure. The, the Lord healed you of your snake bite. That's right. Correct. Okay. Five years old, drinking poison, getting bitten by snakes. Right. And here I am in preschool, and uh, I had this, uh, I had a teacher whose name was Miss, Miss Becca. Okay. She was a, a POC. And a person of Christ? She was a person of color. Of what? Of color. Of color. Yes. Okay, you'll see, you see, you guys say color different than I do. Uh, you like add a U or something. Right, color. It's very British. Right, you, you're from rural Indiana, which I hear they don't call them persons of color in rural Indiana. <laughs> but uh, They typically don't, but this is a nationally syndicated podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, uh, anyway, I was, I just remember we were all sitting there in the room. Miss Becca had the TV on, on the news. And we watched the second plane hit, and all of the smoke comes pouring out. And she started uh, praying and swearing that she saw the devil's face in the clouds. Yeah. And, yeah, it was a big deal. I, that's, that's exactly what I remember because, like, whenever I was a kid, I was like, oh, my God, the so, devil just attacked us. <laughs> that, that was my thought process. He's punishing us for gay marriage. <laughs> <laughs> also, Seth's here tonight. Uh, un- totally unrelated. Uh, I, <laughs> Jeremiah left me in the bathroom alone with Seth. I attacked him. Progressive. I'm, t- I'm telling you, I'm in a weird mood tonight. Yeah. So, uh, it's sorry, nice. so that's really what shaped... That is your main, most vivid memory of 9-11? Yeah, that's, that's definitely Miss Becca telling you that yep. Satan did it? Yep, and me fully believing that Satan was actually like in the plane. No like, I believe that Satan was flying the plane. And I'm like, holy crap. How do you feel about Muslims? <laughs> well, they're not Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Close. <laughs> so, so what do you actually know about 9-11? Like, when I say the events of September 11th, do you, what history do you know about that particular event? I, I don't know much, to be honest. Like, it, it was, by the time that I was old enough to be interested in uh, the wars in Iraq and uh Going into Afghanistan and uh, everything, it was it was a meme more than anything. Well, didn't you? I'm sure you probably had quite a few classmates that ended up going to serve in the military. Yeah, but, a know, lot, a lot of really good friends. And it wasn't a discussion that came up about what they were trying to accomplish over no. there or what was going on. No, that was never brought up. Really? Yeah. So they just sort of sort of blindly it, served for. Country. It was it was yes. like going to accounting school for them basically. It was just a yeah, job. Well, it was. It was, they saw American Sniper with Chris Kyle and thought, what an American badass, that's what I want to be. Amazing. Okay. Chris Kyle was the, uh, the American Sniper who was killed, and they made a movie about him, and yeah. uh, most kills in Iraq, I think it was? Yeah, he had the most, most, as a sharpshooter, the most kills, and then the longest, the record for the longest shot, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Supposedly. then someone recently beat it, I th- yeah. think, within the last year. Uh, so, okay, so do, do you know... Like, for instance, do you know that Saddam Hussein attacked us on 9-11? It was Saddam Hussein that masterminded the attacks. It's, I know who Saddam Hussein is, Chris. Yes. Okay, yeah, but you know that he was behind the attacks, right? He was personally behind the attacks? Yeah, he's the mastermind. That depends on what your belief system is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was Osama bin Laden. Do you, do you really believe that? Please say that. No, I... I don't even get, I get the, I don't even know what the names are, to be honest. There's no face that gets put with the name. Okay. Really? So, like, your memory isn't about, because, like, yeah, I mean, This I, is not your the, podcast. Keep your mouth shut, Jeremiah. <laughs> well, like, through the 1980s in the United States, the boogeyman was the Ayatollah Khomeini from Iran, at, you know, after yeah, the like revolution. Yeah, like, my, my image, the face that comes up whenever you say Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein is the bad guys that I shot at when I played Call of Duty. Okay. Hmm. So it's nothing more than like an abstraction, not, you know, as Donald Rumsfeld once called Saddam Hussein a strategic regional ally in 1983 before yeah, like to liberate him. None of that registers in my mind. In it, it's sort of like for, for, I'm as 34 and you're 32? 32. 32. 32. I mean, think about how much we know about Iran-Contra. Yeah. I mean, edu- the, the, our school system did not teach us about Iran, Iran-Contra and the weapons dealing and the Nicaraguans. I mean, most people in the audience are, like, they have no concept of what that means, so... And Vietnam, we don't really know much about Vietnam because we weren't taught it in school because it's such near history that that would be politicized so they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. 
So you I really mean, they didn't, wouldn't they talk about it. There wasn't a session. Like, so everyone takes world history, obviously, junior year in high school, traditionally, right. or freshman year. And there wasn't a part of, like, necessarily about 9-11. Uh, that segment was more so, well, there were these towers, and then there weren't. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was that simple, but they, uh, they showed the pictures of the pilots that they believe were flying the planes, mm -hmm. but there was no, um, there was no finger pointed at who actually orchestrated the attacks. Do okay. do you know what country those pilots, those pilots? Saudi Arabia? Okay, yeah, so you yeah. do know that. Okay, I do know that, and I don't mean that to like shame you. I did try to trick you at first, and then it worked, and I was like, oh shit, I might have embarrassed him. I feel bad now. <laughs> this is hilarious. It's age shaming. <laughs> age shaming, I know, uh, but. That, to me, I think illustrates the point that, like, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, you were just kind of an abstraction. Right, yeah, absolutely. Right. So I guess it's... we should probably go back in time and talk a little bit about how 9-11 developed, because I think for, maybe, or should we start with our own 9-11 stories? I mean, if you want to, go ahead. I mean, if, if that's uh, how you'd me, rather go. Let me, start, let me start with mine, because, and then I'll kind of weave it back around, and we can get into the history of 9-11 and how it developed, because... I, like most Americans, was completely shocked that the attack happened. I was uh, completely surprised that all of a sudden the towers were attacked and this was a great betrayal. And it was, uh, I, so I turned 18 on 9-9-2001. On 9-9-2001, uh, I signed up for the Selective Service, which is, for you ladies, the draft. On 9-11-2001, I shit my pants because <laughs> I was 18 and I was going to war. I mean, it, it was, it was uh, deeply uh, personal for me. I had always been a jingoist, which is somebody who questions the value of their patriotism without any higher thought. I loved America. I grew up on Rush. I was a Republican. I was at eighteen. In oh, high school? oh yeah. You were politically aware in high school. Absolutely. Oh. I gr I remember skipping a movie to sit in the car at the Greenwood Park Mall to listen to the uh, trial of the impeachment proceedings of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. Yeah, so or yeah, or like. I, I didn't have a lot of friends. <laughs> I still don't. <laughs> Uh, but I, I was really into politics because when we went on the sixth grade Washington D.C. trip, I stood on at it was like it was dusk, and it was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, and I was looking at the Washington Monument and Congress, and I just fell in love with the town and everything that that symbolized. Potomac fever. Absolutely, and so I was just a die-hard great American. And I was bound and determined to get involved in Republican politics to make it great again. And I See, believed I, everything that came along with that. I think it was House of Cards that made me get into politics. Really? Yeah. Oh, like, boy. Yeah. That's a cynical inspiration. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, for, I mean, for our generation, oh, no, a no. lot of us, it was the West Wing. You know, yeah. The West Wing's the, like, the antithesis to the kind of dark, manipulative, Machiavellian nature of right. House of Cards. It is like yeah. there are these incredibly brilliant people all trying to work to, you know, do do the right thing, but they're just always thwarted. See, I, I, I mean, I grew up as a Republican, and I was politically aware in the fact in high school that I just hated lefties. You know, like, that's... that's well, you are Greg's son, so... <laughs> that's as far as politics went with me, right. like, whenever I was... That's a commie, that's not a person. That's yeah, That's a helicopter right. ornament. <laughs> and then it was, I... We started uh, getting into House of Cards, and it was like, okay, this is awesome. You and liked then that. that. I loved it. In. Oh, yeah. Like, the, the games that were played... Um, the strategy? Between them. Oh, yeah. That, that's, what drew, that's what drew me in. I started paying more attention. And then I heard Austin Peterson give a speech. Austin Peterson brought made was your like can, your Ron yeah, Paul. Yeah, he was your Ron yep. Paul. That huh. yeah, that's who it was for me. And uh, that's interesting. That's yeah. the first person yeah. I heard say that. And then yeah. I looked up Indiana Republicans uh -huh. or Indiana Libertarians, and I, it was Rex Bell's name that popped up. Yep. And uh, ordered a Rex Bell sign. Jeremiah dropped it off at my house. Thought that me and my friend Chase were gay together. And then uh, <laughs> what? How? <laughs> In Henry County, no. In Henry County. Yeah, it's very progressive. You know what they say about Spiceland. Oh well, because you you <laughs> two young swinging bachelors in the same place, you know. He's he's. What we else is out. what else is Jeremiah to think but that you two are gay? We were 
right? planting flowers and doing yard work. So I, I, mean, <laughs> okay, I can see where right. he got it. And he dropped off the sign and he Point said... Point advantage Jeremiah, yeah. honestly. He, he started to get into his uh, truck and he said, by the way... You two have a lovely home here. <laughs> How do you feel about Lindsey Graham? <laughs> uh, so that's just amazing to me that you were brought at one that Austin Peterson. You're so young that Austin Peterson is the person that converted you and sort of walked you down the path. Because I consider him so young. You know, I think Austin's only 36. Yeah. And that's just astounding to me that you would someone I can would consider a peer is potentially responsible for. Um, you know, intellectually developing and nurturing along uh, young minds that are sort of disenfranchised with the Republican yeah. Party. Well, and see, I'd always said, like, it was always my thing where I would say, I wish that there was a party that had the economic principles of the Republicans and somebody that had the socio, the social policies of the Democrats. And I was, that was always my thing. Like, do you, somebody do you, needs to do that. Even their Jim Crow laws? Do you remember what yes. platform that you found Austin Peterson on? Like, was it just somebody shared a, something on Facebook? I think it was an ad on Facebook. Okay. Like, an ad that he had, uh, like, paid for to target probably, probably he was Republicans. Probably just kicking off Libertarian Republic. Yeah, would be my yeah. Guess, right about that time frame. And then during Ron Paul's revolution in 2012. Okay, so back to me. <clears throat> uh, so <laughs> Tell me more about when you fundraised for the troops. I will. And, uh, and love Dick Cheney. So 9-11 was so profound for me that it changed every belief system that I had because I was an atheist up until that point. Like you and I went to the same church and the same high school. Yeah, I was becoming disillusioned after serving my time and being paroled and <laughs> right. just entering the rehab program. Well, when I was like four or five, my mom had spotty attendance at the Methodist church and so they had these sticker charts of attendance, and then the teachers would all shame me for not showing up. And I just, <laughs> I was so outraged at the man already at five that I was just like, I, it's not my fault. How dare you hold this against me? So I was like, Christians are bad. And so I became, an, I became a hardcore atheist until I was 17 and a half. And, uh, and then I started to, um, I read Siddhartha in my junior year, and Siddhartha kind of made me think about Buddhism, but then when 9-11 happened, it was so shaking to me that I decided to go to church that Wednesday, that following Wednesday. I remember it was, uh, so it, I was in high school, I was a senior, and Mrs. Burris, my favorite teacher, I was in her, I had the first period open, and she ran in and she said a plane hit the, the Twin Towers, and so we thought it was just like everybody did, an accident. And so we ran over to the other teacher's room and we watched the second plane hit. And that was uh, when everybody realized that second plane hitting, like, was it 14 minutes later? Yeah. When everybody realized this was coordinated. And that's when, like, I'm still, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it because it was so overwhelming and in impactful. Uh, because at 18 and you're a senior in high school, you're... You're old enough to be an adult and a cognizant person, but you're also a super dumbass. So, <laughs> so you're very malleable still. Uh, and, and so I was just, every, all these emotions flooded in that I'm, I'm now, I'm getting drafted. I'm going to war. I'm going to kill whoever did this. We are at war. There's no doubt from that moment on, it was like, there's no doubt we're at war. I went to physics class, and that was the second period class, and we just canceled class. And we sat there and watched the, the we watched CNN, and we watched the first tower fall. And it was just, I could make the noise that I made again. It was just, ah! I mean, it was just everybody in the room audibly shrieked when that happened because it was just terrifying. Because th at that moment, as a human being, you connect and you go, there are tens of thousands of people in these buildings every day, and they might be dead. It was that night that they started talking about how they thought there were 20,000 people that were dead. I mean, we didn't know for weeks that 3,000 had died. Yeah. I mean, it was... I mean, it was, it was... It was impossible to tell in the carnage, you know. Absolutely. Towers of such size coming down. And so... Trying to sort through the madness. Yeah, you have this... You, you just see this come down and like you see the weird noises coming from the, the, the drywall and the whistles of the sirens the all all crunched up and squished by the noise of the 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 human debris and the regular debris filling the air and it just was 
I think for anybody who was cognizant at that point, it was a threat to your humanity. It was a threat. I mean, it was, I, I don't think if, unless you've been through a traumatic situation, people who've been through traumatic situations as, as children or as adults, and you've had that moment of intense fear as well as a total loss of your personal security, where someone else is in control of your life and your personhood, that I think is the only way that you can uh, describe it to somebody like Dakota. It was a traumatic event for not only the country, but for every person who was uh, not five, <laughs> you know? And it w that's why I think the reaction <laughs> to it- You think the devil was in the, right. in the cloud of dust because Miss Becca. Yep. Yeah, well, it, it was somebody did this and it was probably someone who was an Arab. And we, I mean, th that's what I thought. I mean, and I mean, who, turns out was, I was right. Uh, and so, did it? We had two. You had twins in your class that uh, their father was the head of uh, head of the North American Islamic Association. Yep, Isna. Yep, Dr. Saeed. And so they were twins in your class. And did it change how you looked at them? Not me, but I can tell you that uh, two per ninety eight percent white in my school, two percent were minorities. And 1.75% of that 2% were Muslim because we had one of, the, one of the world's largest denominations of mainline Muslims in our, in our town. Yeah, I mean, Osama bin Laden had been to the... Musa, yeah. Musa Saeed has gone on. If you look up M-U-S-A-S-Y-E-E-D, he was one of my best friends in high school. Musa has gone on to be a documentary filmmaker about the Muslim experience across the world and has made documentaries for PBS, he's been in Tribeca and Sundance, and he's been able to take this experience and translate it into uh, something that is great art. And I saw people that had grown up with Musa and Isa since grade school, who knew, including one of my best friends, one of my best friends who had, you know, your friends in high school, you hang out every weekend, you have slumber parties, you ever have slumber parties in high school, Greg? Oh yeah, cause we'd have people come over. And we'd take all the, you know, take all the. Uh, actually, it was just like the wild, last wall party. Yeah. We, we'd fake wrestle. Yeah. Except, you know, you kicked Harry's ass, and I thought that was kind of racist. <laughs> Harry tried to stone cold stunner me, and then uh, thank God Tanner came in at the last minute and gave him the people's elbow because I was in danger. Uh, but I saw people look at Musa and Issa differently and start to treat them differently. And I remember police detail had to go out to the entrance yeah. to, the, to it because there were guys headed out there with shotguns and their pickup trucks. And people, uh, my, my best friend goes, well, you know they're stockpiling nuclear weapons. I go, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. They're not stockpiling nuclear weapons in the basement of the mosque over there. He goes, they all stick together at the end of the day. You've known Musa and Issa your whole life. They're not terrorists. He goes, we really can't trust them. You don't know them. I go, uh, I'll call him Dave. I go, Dave, we've spent countless hours with this person, and you we've think that they work together. You think that they? Are, we've, <laughs> no, I mean they were very faithful. They yeah. prayed five times a day. But I was just, it was a stunning revelation a couple months after 9/11 that even somebody who had an intimate friendship with two Muslims could automatically just shift that around, and so. So that day, we went to a newspaper because I was on the high school newspaper, and we, we observed like the news gathering process and just the whole conversation was about that all day. Went to um, work that night. We closed early. I worked at a hardware store, Mitch's Incredible Ace. The best. And uh, we were sold out of flags by the end of the day. We, we could not keep flags in stock. Valley Forge was the flag maker. They made all the flags by hand in Virginia. They couldn't keep them in stock for months. And so every time we'd get a shipment in, we'd have to call people and say, hey, your flag's here, because people were pre-ordering them. The, the amount of patriotism that was going on at that time was just so off the charts, but... I think it still lingers today. I'm sure people on the way here saw on overpasses people waving flags to right. remember the first responders and to honor them. Right. I mean, still, there's still elements of it that continue on. Well, yeah. and a, a lot of things have lingered since that day. I mean, I can... See, I grew up in a really small rural school, uh, Tri High, in Strawn, Indiana, and, uh, I mean, it was... My senior year, before I had ever met a Muslim, and it was, and it turned out he wasn't even Muslim. He was Sikh, 
and he owned the, uh, <laughs> yeah, he owned the right. Taste of India restaurant in uh, in Spiceland, and me and my friend had went in there because we'd never tried Indian food, and um, he's you know dressed in you know he's got the full turban, he's wearing a robe. He's got, like, these shoes, like, the actual shoes that, like, genies wear. Aladdin shoes. Yeah, that, like, curl right. up on the end. His mustache is curled and everything. And he, uh, we got to talking to him, and I was 100% sure he was a Muslim. And he's like, and uh, my friend Sam said something to him, like, like, oh, are you, are you Muslim? And he's like, no, no, I'm Sikh. And, uh, like, talks about I'm where he's high. from. And <laughs> this is go. <laughs> And he, uh, he, he got to talking to us about how, like, everybody thinks that he's Muslim. Nobody knows that Sikh is even a religion that exists. And, like, in that moment, like, it clicked with me. Like, I, I had always thought, like, there's no way that I'm racist in any way, shape, or form. And then it, like, my mood shifted whenever I found out he wasn't Muslim. You were more Around positive him. towards him? Yeah. And yeah. It, that was, like, a, that was a, a defining moment for me, like, Oh my God! I was I was judging this man because I thought that he was base. I was thinking he was Muslim, and that's like it. It's just not true. It was like yeah. a, this whole internal battle that I had with myself. There were a lot of uh, Sikhs that were killed in the in the days after because they just looked like they were Muslim. I mean, it was you. The it, it went on for years. I mean, I remember the morning went on for years. The, the, uh, the racism still exists. I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways, we are much more racially divided than we were on September 10th, 2001. Uh, we're much more racially divided. I mean, if, if, if four years ago, we weren't having conversations about race regularly on this podcast. Now, no, I mean, now it's... Before Mike Brown, because that was yeah. sort of the kicking off of the... You know, it was supposed to be a post-racial presidency with Barack Obama and the rise of multiculturalism, and what ended up happening was the police state Put a halt to all that. Yeah. And so when you have a, a traumatic situation, it changes the way that you think and it changes the way you behave and it changes what you will accept. And you will accept um, things that you did not accept before. Uh, and so he, it, it was a spirit of get them, get anybody who did this, anybody who had anything to do with it. And so it was a blank check to go into Afghanistan. We went into Afghanistan less than a year later. I mean, it was... It was well, that's where we trained them in the 80s. Yeah, I mean, it was... But you, we didn't know that at that point. Like, we weren't... Yeah, most of we them, weren't, I mean, but the government very right. much did. Like, that's why they knew to go to Afghanistan, because they knew that that's where bin Laden fled to after Sudan. Right. When Clinton had a chance to get him. Um, but it wasn't worth it after the, uh, the World Trade getting hit with a bus. You remember the attack of the World Trade Center? Right. It was with a bus in the 90s. Yeah, 93. It wasn't worth the risk for Clinton to, uh, you know, get into an international incident. So yeah. they opted out of it. But the real thing was, is we, the Mujahideen came and met with Ronald Reagan. and We funded him. If you've ever seen Charlie Wilson's war, Saudi Arabia matched dollar for dollar all of our black appropriations to the CIA to fund the Mujahideen and drive the Russians crazy while they were trying to annex it. And it basically is the exact same strategy they turned around and employed on us is just literally try to walk people into enough bullets till you drive you drive them crazy and bleed them financially to death. Yeah, and f <laughs> we're still there. Oh, it's, that's what I mean. We it's just a, added more troops to Afghanistan. Right, and you know that's in going to the Sikh thing is like most people don't even realize that Pakistan is independent of India and used to be part of it, and they're battle. They've fought the Muslims damn near longer than anybody over Kashmir. Yeah, right, India and India and Pakistan fight over Kashmir, which is where Musa and Isa were from. Right. And it's a war zone, but it's caught between these two cultures. Yeah, it's a very, it's one of the few fertile, rich Egypt, uh, regions, you know, right. a lot of natural resources. And so it is a constant, and at this point, though, in today's world, raw materials are such a commodity and so cheap. What's the point? Right. But it's more just a pride thing. You know, it's a constant tribal warfare between a group of people that declared independence because of their religion and a group of people who are Sikh, but share, you know, certain skin traits and, you know, the, they're just different in the United States from our framework. Right. And so, like, I, I had the same kind of experience. My roommate was uh, a Jane Indian, uh, first year of college. Walk in with my parents, and there are two Jane Indians blowing up a fatty patty doll. And my a mom, what? Uh, what is a that? A blow up sex doll. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> well, now your par- now your parents are upset for a whole different well, set of reasons. They, they had met Nish on my visit, and they're like, "Oh, he's such a nice kid." And then there, Nish and Rohan blowing up a fatty patty doll on the bed, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, "These are some weird Indians." Because <laughs> I didn't know much about it, but then I got exposed to Diwali and all that stuff, and you know, right. knew came to know it very well. But there was several a big group of Sikh Indians we'd hang out with, especially Duman and. Uh, he, the first time, though, I, 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 for so long, it became his nickname, called him Nobby because of his turban, and then it had a knob on it. Right. And so the just, and he, he owned it and went with it, but right. you just don't know these things. Can you believe it. that? Greg making fun of someone for their culture, their well, ethnicity. No, I mean, then then my, my roommate, the Jane Indian, he, he doesn't care for the Sikhs, so he starts going, Nobby, Nobby, Nobby. Oh, no. <laughs> it gets spread, so they turn on themselves. <laughs> they turned on themselves. <laughs> Inner Indian racism. Yeah, so it, it just it, so you go into Afghanistan and then the Iraq War debate started. It did. Iraq and so was we go into two, 2002 and everybody's fine with Afghanistan and then the idea of invading Iraq gets brought up. Well, as everybody rightly pointed out, like Iraq didn't have anything to do with 9 11. Why would we go into Iraq? So the argument, which now doesn't make sense because we have the benefit of hindsight. Like, if you go back and study Nazi Germany, the idea of Lebensfrau, or I don't think I'm saying that right, Lebensfrau, is the idea of leg room. Germany's too crowded. We need, more, we need more leg room. And so that, that makes total sense. Let's kill some Jews. <laughs> like it, and you read that and you go, that's insane. But it's the same idea that if we go to Iraq and we blow it all up, we will create a vacuum for terrorism and they will all go there. We'll fight them over there so we don't have to fight them here. And then we we'll won't take the war to them rather than like we just were attacked. Exactly right. You know, that, was the con- that was the theory. And so when, when people say that Bush created ISIS and Obama created ISIS, that's what they mean. Like, we created ISIS. We created ISIS because we, we created this vacuum in 2003 and 2004 in, Afga- in Iraq that then led to this mass destabilization that fi- that. 15 years later... is still the same, if not worse. Not only that, we're sending arms. So in Afghanistan, we were fighting with weapons that we had sold through Charlie Wilson's war to the Mujahideen. Yeah, we were, Egypt they were, actually, you know, did the handle the transfer of the sale. Yeah, and then now when we fight ISIS, we're fighting our own weapons again, and then we can't figure out why we have these problems. So I think for me, over time, I was, I was very jingoistic in 2003... When we went into Iraq, I couldn't believe that there were these people that were so unpatriotic that they would protest the war. Mm -hmm. So I held a support the troops rally. I held a pro-war rally. The whole point was, I'll call it support the troops, because then you won't find out that it's pro-war, because it can't be pro-war, but I was was pro-war. You partnered with a pro-Cheney super PAC, right? Uh, No, I partnered with Greg Garrison, and he, uh, he had... Steve Booyer and Dan Burton, he invited them to come speak. Watermelon Dan. We had uh, 1,500 people the day after Thanksgiving in 2003, and it was freezing cold, but we still had a ton of people show up. I had the police arrest the anti-war protesters. I was like, have you seen PCU? uh, With Jeremy Piven? Jeremy Piven, I was, I was the David Spade character. Oh, <laughs> so many naps violated. We had uh, Michael Moore's movie, you know, yeah, uh, Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit 9-11, and there was a Dick Morris rebuttal, and I showed a screening of both of those. Toe sucker Morris, huh? Because I knew that I couldn't just show the Dick Morris movie. I had to show both, and there were a lot of conservatives because I was head of the Young Republicans, the College Republicans in 2004 at IUPY, and was very pro-Bush, uh, <laughs> I, I was, that was the only kind of bush I could get in college, so I had to be pro-Bush. And uh, was, you know, tabling for Bush because he had saved, uh, he had saved our freedoms. It's like a modern-day equivalent of trying to sell war bonds. Exactly. And so I go to work with Abdul, and Abdul starts shredding everything I believe. I work with Andy Horning, and he fills in the gaps of all the things that Abdul ruined. And so I was kind of left without this ideology. I knew I was a libertarian, and then when I heard Ron, but I didn't buy into the foreign policy stuff, because if we don't go kill Muslims, they're going to come here and kill us, because the ideology had been so ingrained in me because of that event that I had spent years advocating for a violent foreign policy. And when I heard Ron Paul talk about non-interventionism, the idea that, uh, of blowback was for me one of the most um, eye-opening ideologies I'd ever heard, which is, you know, we're fighting our own weapons. 
We're funding the people that we have to fight 30 years later. We the are, reason they're so good is because we trained them. The idea that we propped up the Shah of Iran, which led to the Iranian Revolution, and now Iran's a problem for us, so we need to go fight them. It's like, wait a minute, none of this makes any kind of sense. Like, we are engaging in all, like, I didn't know that the CIA did what the CIA did. I just thought that they were patriots fighting for our freedom. Mm -hmm. And Watching the evil people. Yeah, Ch Chalmers Johnson wrote these books about blowback and John Perkins. Confessions they, of an Economic Hitman. Yeah, I mean, these were books that were very foundational to me, and so now I'm here, uh, and I don't believe in uh, isolationism. I believe that we should use our free trade to support uh to support other countries. The second you flood North Korea with money, they're oh, yeah. going to straighten themselves out. Which is what they're definitely afraid of. Is, right. You know, economic liberalization. But this, uh, the idea that somebody would call me a neocon was so, would piss me off so much. But that's the ideology that I was consistently supporting. And I, I would argue everyone in this room, I mean, except for the very young crowd, like Dakota, it's, it's different. Anyone under probably the age of around 25, it's wildly different. But 9-11 is... It has shaped our entire life. Yeah. It's yeah, the quintessential it, defining moment and really of libertarianism. It, it, it turned me into a Christian. I mean, I'm, like I've said, I'm a terrible Christian, but. You saw Ron Paul and you said, that's for me. It was, there's a Liberty Jesus. Um, but I went I to church. That was Larry Sharp. No, that's your version. Yeah. Oh, okay. I went to church and then that led down the rabbit hole of me becoming a Christian several months later because it, it was just, I was so shook. As the YouTuber kids say, I'm shook. Well, isn't it sad, though? It, that's the truth, though, because it takes some kind of it takes some kind of calamitous event to break your personally held belief system. And then you are introduced to all these contradictions that you had held as dogma forever. And really, your entire identity is wrapped up into them. Your social system, what you do, what you value, who you want to be associated with. And 9-11 for us is just, it's amazing to me because if it had not been for that event, it is, I mean, it led to Snowden. It led to the police state. It led to the surveillance state, which ended up leading to the drones and, the, you know, the military exchange program with local police forces, drone, drone strikes, signature drone strikes, um, really spent trillions and trillions of dollars trying to get democracy to take hold in a place where it's not so much that they're anti-democratic for the most part, like as we saw in Egypt when they elected a Muslim Brotherhood leader, it's that they are anti-United States-sponsored democracy. And that's totally normal. If King George had come to the United States and said, well, yeah, I'm going to set up your representative form of government. Here's how your constitution should look. Here's how your chambers should look. What would have happened would have been like, you know what? No, just out of principle. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be fascists. I, yeah, if, if Canada invaded tomorrow and came into Indianapolis and occupied Indianapolis and removed every elected official, instituted their own city council, their own mayor, with all of that backing, and said, this is the new government, I think everybody in Indianapolis and the surrounding area would go, uh, the fuck you are. Right. You know, and... Right. And it's it, not even it, that so much, you know, that it's a bad thing, because honestly, you look at India... India left, you know, if you have to be subject to an empire that eventually, you know, goes away, you would pick British because they leave behind, you know, institutions and, right. you know, roads and all these, all this great uh, sort of societal capital. But those things are rebelled against, even if it's to the own benefit, if it is not organic. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't allow that organic movement to take place, it will never grow and you will just get that sort of teenage rebellion on principle and they hate you forever for the very for no other reason than they will not allow you to dictate to them yes and that's what's that's what's shaped our the last 20 years the last or last 16 years is you look at afghanistan no one's ruled it since alexander the great and that means you have to be a totalitarian you know con uh you know conquester the con Conqueror? Conquistador, yes, yeah, conquistador. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah or yeah, you have to be a conqueror to, right. do it, to have any semblance of hold, and that that is not what the United States will allow. Right. You know, the people. As long if the people are kept ignorant, they'll let it go for a while under the auspices of democracy building, and you know they'll greet us as liberators, which is a lie. And <laughs> you you can't be a functioning democratic republic and be imperialistic 
and not eventually result in a debt crisis. Well, just the idea that our way is the best way. Of course, we believe that our way is the best way, but it's up to other people to choose their best way. And I don't, I don't think that anybody in Iraq, I mean, there may be some people who say, yeah, Iraq is better now than it was under Saddam Hussein, but that's probably because they're making a lot more money because of corruption than they were under Saddam Hussein. I mean, they're... Well, it can't be, but I mean, he was a relatively, you know, as far as radical dictators go, you know, genocidal dictators go, he was... He was your kind of dictator, is well, that I mean, what you're saying? You know, he's like Bashar al-Assad. If you right. had to pick, right. that's your guy. <laughs> I want the Western one, is that what you're saying? Yeah, the one no. that's most white. But no, I would argue even in, like, with the Iranian revolution, right. the Shah was way better for human freedom than the Ayatollah. Right. And that was a democratic uprising. Yes, and the a people the people chose the the Ayatollah. And just like in, in Egypt, when they ele- uh, elected Brunei, the Muslim Brotherhood candidate, and we're going to in- uh, draft a Sharia constitution. That was democratically instituted Sharia, and actually, it would have been better off if you prop up like we are now, Sisi, because he's a secular technocrat. Yeah, I also think that it is it For is. Women. Woefully naive, looking back, the idea that we would just say, well, here's freedom. And they would go, yes, we're ready for freedom. When it it was a birthing process of 300, 400 years for the Americans to birth such a document like the Declaration and the Constitution, and then to get to where we are now, where we have relative, uh, relatively a high level of personal freedom, societies have to evolve, and we had to evolve. And, yeah, they're and, organic, and they're living things. And so to try and force our way of life on an, on somebody who is... Un, it's, it's just... It, it's like if I had tried to force you to live the way that I live... I hate cats. I, I mean, you live in the dictatorship of the boss hog of liberty. What's it like having friendship forced on you every day? I'm not allowed to talk about it, Chris. Really? It's yeah. that bad, huh? I've been sworn, sworn to secrecy. You get See? buried in one of Jeremiah Morrill's strip mines out in Henry County. <laughs> I, I believe that it's the lake in Memorial Park. We saw the alligator swimming in the pool the other yeah, night. Yeah. We understand. You, you, so it is, it is, it's a very tough thing to try and transfer one culture to another and say, here's our culture, you'll like it better. It never works. Right. It, it, because it's arrogant. It's, it's ultimately, it's just incompatible. Absolutely. I mean, India already had a caste system, so it's not like it was terribly different than, you know, sort of the feudal monarchy 